I'm here with uh, Lindsay Shepard. She is a columnist for uh, True North, and she is the author of a book called Diversity and Exclusion, Confronting the Campus Free Speech Crisis. How are you, Lindsay? I'm good. Thanks for uh, buying the book. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I got it in the mail yesterday, and I do look forward to uh, reading it. So uh, my first question to you is, uh, how was 2020? Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just been baffling this whole 13 months, I guess it is now. Mm -hmm. um, how many people are willing to go along with whatever the public health officials and government tell them, even if it doesn't make sense, uh, and how, how people aren't fighting back? It's, it's all very interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, I, I live in Peterborough, and I think um, it was uh, either last year or this February where I came across one of those uh, anti-mask protests, and I saw one of the rebel news people covering it. So there is some resistance, uh, but I think um, I think my main source of uh, what do you call it grievance in the whole year was when um, um, George Floyd was killed and. Uh, and the Black Lives Matter was uh, making a resurgence again. And uh, I understand that the uh, verdict for the, the cop who, you know, who killed him uh, is out and he was uh, charged with guilty. But what really displeased me was that how was uh, the parallel between the uh, onset of the George Floyd killings with uh, the LA riots of uh, 1992 following the beating of Rodney King, if you know what those events were. I don't. Yeah, um, it was um, it was quite like the media firestorm. So there was this uh, black man, Rodney King, I think it was the year 1991 or 92. He was, uh, he was beaten by the police and uh, he, he didn't do anything that was constituted to be criminal. And of course, the um, racial tensions were at a very like high point, at a fever pitch. And I believe the riots, uh, the LA riots in Los Angeles um, broke out because the officers uh, involved with the scene of the crime were acquitted. And the, what really disturbed me about the riots was the extent to which uh, the black rioters and looters they they destroyed like businesses and properties belonging to uh, Asian Americans, and I I I am I, I am quite I was quite fearful that those events would um, you know happen again in the George Floyd protests, which. Uh, to some extent, it they, they, they did happen again. Yeah, well, I mean, I saw the pictures on social media about, you know, like the businesses putting black owned in front mm -hmm. of their business as to not be targeted mm -hmm. um, so that they wouldn't be targeted. Um, but in some cases, they still were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, the, yeah, last summer was um, it even you know, it had a lot of effects on free speech here too. I mean, this, you know, as you said, there was a resurgence of Black Lives Matter. Um, there was a professor at Laurentian University named David Le Barrer, and he tweeted, um, hashtag all lives matter. Mm -hmm. You know, he said he was a, I think, evolutionary biologist, something of that nature. And so he, on his personal Twitter account, he, he said something about how we've all evolved from, you know, a common ancestor um, all lives matter. And yeah. Laurentian University said, um, you know, the, the president said that was an inappropriate and offensive tweet. Oh, wow. And he was removed from his position as Dean of Graduate Studies over that tweet. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, as, as you might know, Laurentian University is bankrupt and going through a restructuring. Oh, wow. And um, so they've cut a lot of departments. And this professor who had the inappropriate and, and offensive tweet um, his department survived, but he, you know, for some reason was the one professor that was fired. So. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, which uh, brings me neatly to the uh, title of your 
book, uh, Diversity and Exclusion. And then uh, the cover featured the word inclusion being crossed out. And so uh, my, my question to you, my first question to you is, uh, I think, a pre-pronged one. Uh, who is doing the excluding? Who is being excluded? And on what basis do they rely to exclude people? Yeah, so the people being excluded are anyone who is open to different viewpoints, because the title is really a comment on um, diversity ideology in universities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I don't think we have to rehash the, the Laurier scenario because people can read the book. But, um, you know, I was, when I was found myself in a disciplinary meeting, one of the people there was a diversity office bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. And um, it was then when I kind of learned what diversity inclusion equity offices do on campus. And what they do is they are there to enforce ideological conformity. They're there to ensure that you have the approved viewpoints, that you have the correct viewpoints. Mm -hmm. That is the reason they're there. Um, and so if you prove to be one of the people who um, has an incorrect opinion, mm -hmm. uh, or you're just maybe open to hearing about those different opinions, then you will find yourself on the outs and you will find yourself um, not being, you know, they actually don't want to include you in their ideology of inclusion. They want you out and um, away. Of course, yeah. <clears throat> uh, in my experience, uh, political movements and ideologies that base themselves on a sense of exclusion, they never work and they always divulge into something incredibly toxic. And it's, um, I'm glad you mentioned the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter thing, because uh, both statements are in itself correct. Um, well, one includes more than the other. And I, I, I do find it staggering how, you know, All Lives Matter is being used or, uh, or being seen as a sort of like a reactionary uh, racist stuff against, you know, the correct uh, movement. And I want to ask you, I want to ask you, what, what, in your view, are the quote unquote correct uh, views being enforced by, say, the people of uh, Laurier and as well as, say, any other university, my, mine included? So you have to believe that um, Canada is a systemically racist country that was founded on genocide of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. so that is something you have to believe in and repeat. Um, you have to believe that you are a, if you're not indigenous, then you're a uninvited guest on indigenous lands. Mm -hmm. um, you have to believe that trans women are women and therefore, even if they are biological males, um, mm -hmm. they should be in women's prisons and women's spaces, women's shelters. And you have to, you know, go along with pronouns. The, those offices, they like to put pronouns. I remember seeing in, in the gym change room, um, just, you know, stuff about respecting pronouns. They really like to enforce that. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to be pro-choice. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a pro-life person, then you're trying to control women's bodies, stuff like that. So those are just some of the examples of the correct viewpoints. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, regardless of how you, you know, um, how you consider the merits of uh, whichever the opinions uh, espoused by, I guess, what you would call the left-wing orthodoxy. I mean, you may believe them or you may not, but the, um, the extent to which they demonize and villainize and exclude the people who you know who believe otherwise who do not really buy into much of their stuff i find it to be very staggering which uh which brings me brings me to um i guess the idea of postmodernism because i think uh i think the the sort of like uh, what uh that montreal professor gatsat called the diversity uh inclusivity and equity religion or die uh, finds its roots in postmodernism. And can you tell me, I, you were in uh, communication studies, correct? Yeah. So 
in my communication degree, when I was doing my undergrad, um, there was a lot of Marx, but there wasn't necessarily, there was a lot of Michel Foucault, actually. Oh, yeah. That's often the, the fundamental, yeah, mm -hmm. theorist of these programs. Um, but it wasn't until I did my, um, I entered my grad program, which was in cultural analysis and social theory, mm -hmm. where I encountered all these other postmodern theorists, you know, like Deleuze, Jacques Derrida, mm -hmm. um, again, more Foucault, that um, I really started to question, what am I even reading? Is there any substance here? And I, I just became, it, it was really difficult because when you see yourself as, as a good student and you've made it into grad school and all of a sudden you're like, I'm not seeing the point in these readings of these theorists that I'm supposed to be upholding and I'm supposed to be seeing them as so important and I'm just not seeing what I'm supposed to be seeing. And so it was at that point where I started you know, just Googling, why is my grad program all about <laughs> Marx and postmodernism. And um, although I had heard of Jordan Peterson before, mm -hmm. it was kind of at that point where I uh, started, I watched one video of him and Camille Paglia. Do you, have you ever oh, yeah. watched what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, I, I know of her. Uh, she has a great book uh, called Break, Blow, Burn about uh, poetry, which you really should check out. Okay. So I watched, you know, a two hour discussion between Peterson and Paglia and I was like, wow, like finally two people are ripping apart these postmodern theorists. Mm -hmm. And it was then when I kind of became more comfortable with my instinct, which was that there's nothing to the postmodernists. They're, they're, it's very empty. It's intellectually empty. And um, finally, when I heard Peterson and Pelia talking about it, it kind of confirmed that. And I was just happy to hear prof other professors mm -hmm. saying it. Yeah. Um, um, my point about uh, Michel Foucault, whose name is mentioned a lot in uh, my own classes as well, as well. Uh, I'm a Trent University student and I, uh, I'm in English literature. Uh, somehow he makes it to, into the curriculum, but I think he's more popular in the culture study stuff. Um, my opinion of him is largely derived from a book by uh, Sir Roger Scruton, a British philosopher called Thinkers of the New Left. Um, his, I think his conclusion is that um, even though Foucault himself has several pretty interesting ideas, um, he, he uh, reaches these conclusions, which are obviously, um, you know, it's a very radical take on anti-establishmentism and he thinks that all the social norms that we have uh, quote unquote taken for granted, like say family and hospitals and uh, prisons are all, to borrow a phrase from uh, Louis Althusser, ideological state apparatuses used by one dominant power group to, you know, uh, subject another like group that is, doesn't have power. And which is very ironic because uh, around the end of his life, Foucault contracted AIDS and he needed the help of hospitals as well as the kindness of people who he sees as, uh, you know, cold-blooded power grabbers. Um, yeah, so, and the idea that power works through us, not at us, that was um, often repeated. You're probably more in tune with that stuff. Ever since I graduated, I just... I'm so glad I don't have to engage with that material anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I read Douglas Murray's Madness of Crowds. I don't recently. I love that book. That. Yeah. And he kind of goes into the postmodern, postmodernist, mm -hmm. and I just have to skip through it because it kind of triggers me. <laughs> oh yeah, um, it's it's funny because um, uh, his uh, one of his criticisms of the postmodernist, especially say the Judith Butler type, is that their writing are so opaque and obscure, but then when they, when it comes to the subject of uh, power relations and uh, capitalism, and uh, if you are, say, a uh, feminist, uh, the patriarchy, uh, they make it very clear what they are, are, are up to. And which, uh, 
one of the things that really disturbed me, uh, aside from the, you know, um, very much a revisionist history of uh, the foundations of uh, this country that we both live in, is as I bring it back to the postmodernists, the repudiation and rejection of everything that, uh, say, the fruits of the Enlightenment, the fruits of rationality and uh, science and humanism. Yeah, can you speak some? Can you speak more about that? Um, what I see more of is is a rejection of. I don't know. I, no, I can't really speak more on that. <laughs> I mean, you were, I mean, you were on the, at the epicenter of, uh, sorry, of I just have to, my husband's making noise. I have to tell him to stop. As I said, uh, as I was saying, uh, you were at the, of course, an epicenter of a very much a concerted internet and even a real life campaign against you because you were um, willing to engage an idea that is not part of the orthodoxy, namely the Jordan Pearson video. Uh, so, uh, were there any like uh, physical encounters that that displeased you when at that time? Um, what do you mean? Like uh, in person? I mean, like uh, not off the internet. Like someone came to you and say awful things about you and all that. Um. Do you mean after the controversy had transpired and when I was on campus? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so there were, I mean, so after I went through the controversy, I started a free speech club called the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry. And it was just to, you know, because I truly did believe in, in the value of open inquiry and free discussion on campus. And I wanted to see um, if Laurier would champion that value of free expression by letting us host events that, you know, presented non-mainstream views or un unorthodox views. And, um, you know, we had protests to our events. Um, in one case, we invited Dr. Frances Widowson, who's a professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary, and she is outspoken against indigenization. Right. So just the idea that there are indigenous ways of knowing and um she sees them as sees that as antithetical to science you know like she believes in the scientific method as a way to pursue knowledge and the idea that you have to value indigenous ways of knowing just because they're indigenous um, she sees as you know hindering truth seeking so we invited her to talk about that and um even though she's a Canadian professor talking on a university campus, this was in May 2018, uh, the university, Laurier, charged us over $5,000 just to host her wow. because there was going to be a, a protest. Um, so effectively, we had to pay for protesters to protest our event. And we did fundraise the money on GoFundMe. Mm -hmm. So it was thanks to the people who donated that we were able to host that event because uh, I couldn't come up with $5,000, you know. Um, and yeah, there was, there was protests. I mean, they, they yell things at you, but it's kind of, um, it, there's not much substance to it. Like they would just yell, you know, fuck you, everybody hates you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's not any substantial criticism. So whatever. Um, yeah, but there, there's more in the book though, for, for people who read it, there's Definitely. some interesting encounters. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's really amazing to see because um, I think uh, student and protests are pretty much uh, intertwined. I mean, in it's universities and student protests are like like uh, a fixture. I mean, going back to the '60s with that Abby Hoffman guy. But um, what I find disturbing, among many things, is that is how um, the I guess the the adults in the room, I guess, the uh, the faculty members and the deans and everyone, they acquiesce to these, uh, they, they sort of like kowtow, they submit to these demands. Uh, as if like they, they are not holding the, they're not being, they're enabling these, uh, these people who hold like um, irrational or, you know, views without like these views 
that are without merit or without rationality to to you know do as they like and of course it it uh came to fruition in that uh tragic evergreen incident that uh booted the, the couple uh professor brett weinstein and uh his wife heather hein yeah so it is a minority of students who mm -hmm you know, really see themselves as um, activists and changing the university, changing institutions is their purpose. Mm -hmm. um, because the rest of students are pretty apolitical and um, they just kind of want to do their work and get out with the degree. And so that means the minority of students, um, they really get heard. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're right that, that it's the people in positions of power who could be um, doing something about it, but instead they kind of take a customer is always right approach oh, yeah. and they just want to satisfy their tuition payers. Um, mm -hmm. These seem to be the tuition payers that are dissatisfied. So, you know, they'll just try to satisfy their demands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you, I wonder what your thoughts on this one. Um, I'm, I'm a long believer of uh, separating academia with activism. Of course, as I've said, if you're a student, I mean, there's a likelihood that you would be an activist or you join the sort of like activist movements and all that. But I don't think that the, um, those two lifestyles, at least uh, the lifestyles of academia, which uh, requires rigorous uh, research and rational inquiry and argument and activism, which is to seek a political goal that may not be acceptable to everyone those things should not mix and and a personal anecdote when i when i said that to a, a classmate she said that you know have fun not caring about the rights of minorities and transgender people and i thought well that's the end of that relationship so what, what do you think about that um Sorry, I was reflecting on your anecdote. What were you? What was oh, your... uh, the question? Is uh, uh, what do you think about should academia and activism activism be uh, separated? You know, it's just hard because a lot of the arts and humanities to get in, you have to show you have to, I guess, show passion or like have have a project, and um, those fields when you go into them often your research your passions are related to something to do with identity mm -hmm. um something to do with you know this you know rights of trans people minorities etc and um maybe it's because you know these fields there's just not much else to them i mean when i went into my ma in cultural analysis and social theory i thought that sounds so interesting um my undergrad was in communication studies and I was starting to feel, you know, like I'm, it seems that, you know, these four years have been, a lot of my classes have been pretty similar. And the topic we most often discuss is representations of blank in the media, you know, mm -hmm. representations of queer people in the media. And the conclusion, you know, is always that we need more diversity on screen and off screen. It's just like, it's, we've had this discussion for four years. It's the same thing. Actually, I was having the same discussion in like social studies classes in high school. So um, I thought, okay, where can I, what kind of program can I do where I go on a bit of a deeper level and we start to ask deeper questions and really get mm -hmm. to the bottom of things and, and how society works and stuff like that. So I, I saw, um, I was just looking at an alphabetical list at Wilfrid Laurier's programs and I was about to apply for communication studies, the MA. But then I saw cultural analysis and social theory, and I thought, that sounds so philosophical. And um, I bet it's really interesting. And of course, I, I should have seen the red flags because um, the, you know, the course list, you know, it was all stuff about social justice and, and representations in the media. And um, it was, you know, pretty empty stuff, but... Um, yeah, it was too bad because I thought it was going to be a more meaningful program. Yeah, of course. And what what you were saying, your anecdote, it 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 exemplifies this. Uh, I think there was this intent by 
certain or if not all the humanity to the humanities departments in all university to sort of like train student activists in a sense and and no matter how I believe that academia and activism should not be separated, I think in the natural sciences, it may be a bit easier. In the humanities, it has been pretty much um, infested with, like I said, the postmodernists and uh, uh, their earlier counterparts, uh, the uh, Frankfurt School. Um, I wonder if you if you've uh, had a chance to read the essay, Repressive Tolerance by Herbert Marcuse. Uh, I don't think I've read the essay, but I know the thesis. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to explain it or? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, if you can, in your own words, uh, explain it, that'd be great. Yeah, well, so I think it's the same concept as Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance. Oh yeah. So it, it's just the idea that um, you have to you know, we can't really have an, an open society with all ideas going around because uh, you have to repress the intolerant ideas. Um, so by virtue of having a democratic society and a liberal society, um, you actually do have to repress what they would call fascist or like repressive ideas. I see. Um, is that- uh, In, is that in one sense, yeah. Um, uh, you should really check out, I think, uh, the author, uh, James Lindsay. He published a uh, four-part podcast on basically analyzing the whole essay, which is a rather long one. Now, Marcuse's essay is more like an answer to Karl Popper's, uh, I guess, uh, limits of tolerance question. I think he posed, that in, posed it in uh, The Open Society and Its Enemies. So Marcuse's essay... The central thesis basically is that the intolerant movements are all on the right because they serve to preserve a, um, you know, unjust power hierarchy, and the supposedly tolerant movements are on the left because they seek to abolish that uh, unjust uh, power structure, and so all movement from the right, uh, even the nonviolent ones are to be repressed while all movements from the left, even though they are violent ones, are to be permitted. And I presume that really explains the times these days, even though it was written in the 60s. And in some sense, he helped create the world that we are seeing right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it comes to the Frankfurt School, I don't mind their stuff about um mass culture and the cultural industries and how you know movies now for example they have a whole committee of people on of making the film marketable mm -hmm. rather than it just being art like i don't mind the frankfurt school's work on that kind of stuff but um yeah you know i have to be honest with you um when it comes to the, the postmodern theorists and these works you're referencing i kind of consider like when i went to grad school I did my time by reading this stuff. And so now I really like to pursue other things and I don't, I, I just really don't like engaging with those works anymore. So I'm, I'm glad there is people like James Lindsay. Um, I know he does a lot of work on this and, and getting people to understand what these theories are, you know, critical race theory and postmodern theory. Um, Cause I certainly don't want to do it. So I, I consider myself as having done my time. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, it's not like any of these works that I've mentioned are, you know, engaging or thought-provoking or insightful in any ways. But I found them to be, um, I guess, uh, how you call it, helpful in understanding why we are, why we are doing this. Why are, you know, people sticking by these um, uh, social justice and identitarian movements that are. And they don't really make a, a sound, rational case for it. And instead, they coerce people into believing in them. And you know what's interesting about programs um, like my MA program, which are based on these theories, is I always kind of felt when I was looking at my syllabus, um, is that it's like these programs haven't evolved since, I don't know, the 70s, 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. Like There was almost 
no modern component to these programs unless mm -hmm. you were to purposely as the student you know find a modern day example and apply it to one of these you know one of these theories of Foucault or, or the Frankfurt School um yeah so that that was I remember that being something that struck me when looking at my course syllabus was it's like this is all based on theories that yeah sure fine whatever from back then but um why it's kind of strange when the course can't evolve at all you know mm -hmm. i would say more most courses need to need to evolve yeah of course um i before we have our discussion i i watch a video that you posted on your youtube channel the viral one uh why i think uh, goodbye to the left yes that's that's what the video was and you explained that even though you hold uh, leftist views you you find that the the modern leftist culture has uh, has uh, was it trailed off in ways that you don't really find uh, comfortable anymore. And I I do hope to get a sense of uh, what those views are. And um, I I believe that I think uh, you would say yes to this. But uh, would would you join or would you be comfortable as part of the left if the left uh, you know, get your shit together, as they say. Um, so in that video, Goodbye to the Left, it, I guess the backstory is I considered myself a default leftist. So mm -hmm. when I was going through the Laurier controversy, I was getting accusations that I was, you know, some sort of closeted right winger, and I was mm -hmm. trying to advance a conservative agenda. Mm -hmm. And I just tried to quash that right away. And I said, no, 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 like, I'm a leftist. Um, and I did see myself as a leftist, but like I say, a default leftist, um, because I kind of saw the right as religious, um, big business, pro focused on pro-life issues a lot. And I thought, um, I don't really identify with that at all. Yeah. Um, and I, I think a big part of that also was that uh, I consider myself someone who's very interested in environmental issues. Um, that was probably, you know, the large basis of why I considered myself a leftist. Uh, but I conclude that video by saying, you can just call me what you want, but I'm not going to call myself anything. Um, would I call myself a leftist? No, I like, I don't think, I don't think they fundamentally can get their shit together because this is just kind of what they are now. Um, you know, the kind of hyperbolic way of engaging with, with trans rights issues, for example. Um, they're kind of hysterical. That's just kind of who they are. Um, so I just don't call myself anything. And I think a lot of people are in, are in the same position. And, you know, the trouble is when it comes to voting day, every four years for for federal elections at least and you kind of have to think where do I go who do I go with but for the rest of the time it's you know it's doable to you can be politically homeless most people probably are oh yeah and of course the coalition of the politically homeless will just establish a home for themselves and create a more Heterodox Chamber, which uh, brings me to this. Uh, are you part of the Heterodox Academy founded by, I think, Jonathan Hyde, right? Yeah, I'm a member. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Are you? Uh, I hope to, because uh, it, it, I think it opens to with to graduate students, and I'm not yet one. I'm just an undergrad. So, yeah, I, I do believe that... Um, I do believe that in academia, at least, uh, no idea should be suppressed, even the ones that I don't like. And uh, as well as in, um, you know, the larger social sphere. Um, uh, have you seen this uh, documentary called Mighty Ira? It's about the uh, ACLU um, chairman, uh, Ira Glasser, uh, formerly at least. Uh, he was the one he was the chairman of the ACLU when uh, the Skokie case broke out in uh, 1977. So if you don't already know that, it's the case where 
a bunch of uh, neo-Nazis uh, march through this village of Skokie where the population is predominantly Jewish. And uh, the ACLU under Glasser uh, defended their right to free speech, even though Glasser himself was Jewish and uh, he didn't like their ideologies to say the least. Uh, so it was an example, obviously, of, uh, you know, I may find your ideas abhorrent, but I will defend to the death your right to express them. Uh, which is a uh, very, which is very disappointing because it that value is slowly disappearing because again of the influence of uh, the postmodernists and the um, Frankfurt School people. Uh, I always find that uh, freedom of speech. Uh, I think that was my first entry into what uh, leftist thinking mean. I, I think I, for a time, I was really interested in. The left because of that, because of their commitment to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. I'm from a country that doesn't really allow that, uh, Vietnam. And now I saw that, you know, it is being uh, slowly chipped away, that right is slowly being sort of like delegitimized and being uh, called by these activists to be, you know, uh, preserving of, again, harmful, bad ideas. And I thought, in some sense, you are ceding your ground to, again, the right, because uh, right now, the right-wingers are the ones that are advocating for free speech, and left-wingers aren't. And I, like you, I don't want the right-wing to, you know, to hold a monopoly of discourse, because they themselves hold rather uh, tragically toxic ideals. And I do wish that uh, the left uh, be more, at least more reasonable, not, not as in moderate, but, uh, you know, provide or structure a more reasonable basis to why they support the idea. Yeah, I don't really know what to add. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And uh, I believe uh, our time is almost uh, up. And my last question to you is that uh, how, what would you uh, say or advise to um, say Canadian students or even uh, uh, North American students who are, who are kind of like uh, ideological dissenters from this uh, leftist orthodoxies who are either remaining silent or speak out in the ways that they can. Um, I think a good strategy is to organize and to, you know, so for example, at Laurier, I had the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry. So just having a group of people, you know, grouping together with people who want to discuss a variety of ideas and, you know, aren't scared of being politically incorrect. Um, I think finding that community is really important. Um, and that's why I find the COVID stuff devastating is because I think we need to gather in person and that's where a lot of, you know, the important stuff happens. Um, and, you know, on campuses, I, I mean, you're a student, so you've been going through this for the past 13 months. You know, yes, on, of course. On campus, yeah. Um, I would say... Yeah, that's that's one thing that's really good to do. Does Trent have anything, any kind of free speech club? Uh, they have the uh, Trent Conservatives, which uh, uh, they advocate for these issues. I think they they try to invite you uh, to speak on campus once. But uh, on the opposite side, we now have uh, the Anti-Racism Task Force, which I think uh, I've provided some information to you about, which uh, is growing. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't, aside from my issues with uh, bureaucracies and their, uh, uh, their wasteful spending, I don't find that whatever they're doing is ideologically helpful. Yeah, so I think we need kind of two types of people to change the culture of university, you know, to, I know, I mean, to bring back a culture of open inquiry and one thing is for people to just be steadfast and, and you know, if you're going to be criticized for being a fascist or whatever, just because you're open to different ideas, 
Mm -hmm. um, and you're, you believe in free expression, then so be it. And we need some people to just take that criticism, uh, wave it off and, and keep going and hopefully advance within academia. And, you know, I mean, we're talking about the university in general, but, um, you know, other positions too. Um, but I think, you know, we might also need people who will kind of stay quiet and stay neutral and fit in. Because, you know, some people naturally don't want to take criticism. They don't want to go against the grain. And maybe there is still a place for people like that. Um, you know, so I would say you're someone who's just speaking out and you have this podcast and that's awesome. What you're doing is great. Thank you. But, you know, some people just absolutely don't want to do that. And, you know, maybe their place is, okay, you know, stay quiet and, um, you know, don't, don't show your cards mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years and kind of advance in your career. But then when you get to a, a decision-making position where you have some influence over the university, whether it's in committees or hiring or, or what have you, um, that's when you need to kind of switch and you need to start, you know, openly supporting free expression and stuff like that. So I think there is a place for people who want to, to stay quiet, but um, yeah, there, there are some people who will try to say that they have a family to feed and, and they just don't want to be vocal at all ever. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't know what the place for that is. Um, I guess, you know, supporting other people is, is necessary. I guess it's more of a, a place of support, which is needed. So you know, I think there's a place for everyone to bring back um, the value of free expression. Yeah, of course. Um, I think uh, uh, my, I guess my hypothetical advice would be, would differ from you a bit in that I think that there's value in say, um, I guess, uh, uh, slowly inserting yourself into what do you call it? The uh, the war of ideas, as they call it, like you slowly dip your toes in it by uh, absorbing better ideas and repudiate um, bad ideas whenever you you see them. And um, I mean, most of us aren't in a position of power and influence. So I, it's, um, and there's always this uh, idea of like how, you know, heroic people react and in that uh, they are the, they are not like, they are not people who would usually, who would do like a good heroic things on a daily basis, like a Superman or a Captain America, but they are the right people. They do the right thing at the right time, like uh, that movie Die Hard. So it's that. Um, and I, I think that one of the things that people need to believe is that I don't think there is such a thing as the right side of history. I think that there's history. Uh, there are different competing views. And, uh, you know, the outcome of a historical event can, can you know, can alter, um, can alter without much difference. As in, like, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, alternative history. And uh, I think, um, you know, I always ponder what if, uh, say, the South win the Civil War or JFK hasn't been killed. And, and but the more I delve into those possibilities, uh, the more I thought, I don't think there is such a thing as the right side of history. Um, I think that, again, history is that, a series of events, and they could have gone the other way. It's interesting, though, because... One thing that um, struck me once was in the fall of 2019, I was doing a speaking event um, and Megan Murphy, um, who's a gender critical feminist, she's pretty prominent. Um, she, she was the featured speaker along with John Kay from Colette mm -hmm. and um, another journalist named Anna Slats. And then I was the moderator. And this was to take place at Simon Fraser University. And so from this panel, we had two alumni from Simon Fraser University, myself and Megan Murphy. And so you would think, you know, a university where alumni are speaking publicly and, and are um, kind of recognized in certain circles 
and have gotten their works published and, um, and that kind of stuff. You would think the university would be proud of that, right? Proud of that kind of alumni and want to feature that. But because this talk was on the issue of, um, you know, trans women in women's spaces, biological males in women's spaces, mm -hmm. the university didn't even want it to happen on campus. And so it didn't, um, a protester, like one a anti person got the event uh, canceled and we had to host it at, at a hotel, at a private venue. So it's interesting how, you know, the, you'll see the university champion all the time, you know, only alumni who focus on identity issues and who focus on, you know, the, the leftist pet issues. And the university will champion them, say they're so proud of those people. But, um, you know, someone who's a successful alumni and a successful alum like Megan Murphy just completely ignored. And she did her, her master's at SFU. Um, yeah, and it, it's interesting because I also, I mean, I work at True North. I work for a media organization and I have a communication degree. Is, you know, is the university interested in, in advertising me as working in the field? Absolutely not. Of course not. <laughs> right. So it's, it's all about um, you have to in this case. Yeah, it's not the right side of history, but you have to be on the right side in order to be recognized in a lot of cases. Yeah, and definitely. Um, yeah. What what really interesting, what really interests me about history is that those who think that they are on the right side of history are often wrong and uh, we now have, uh, you know, years and years and tons of documents written about how wrong they were. And it's important to remember that, you know, that, you know, that is not the case. There's no such thing as the right side of history. But, mm, your, but yeah, that, mm, that example of uh, your, you know, your moderated event was given is an example of what diversity and exclusion means. And so that is the title of your book and I would recommend everyone to purchase it. Uh, I really, I thank you very much for appearing on the program. And I don't think that, I think this needs to be said, but of course, what happened, uh, what happened to you at the Wilfrid Laurier was uh, undeserved. And it was to me a ta uh, an act of bullying. And I admire your courage and your perseverance during that, uh, Firestorm. Oh, thank you. And um, thanks for having me on here. I think you're courageous for um, hosting this. Oh, and thank so, you. Yeah, thank you very student. much. And this is what exactly what we need. So, and you're very knowledgeable on, you're well read on these issues. So, yeah. yeah they, they interest me in some ways. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. So, thank you and have a good day. You too.